The Unshackled Waves, episode 262. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. The United States has become known worldwide for its high frequency of mass shootings. These are defined as public gun violence which kills four or more victims. In 2019, at present, there have been 248 mass shootings. The most recent high profile ones were in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. They have led to a renewed push for legislative gun control across the nation. With 393 million guns in the civilian population, uh, gun control measures have largely been rejected, uh, both at the public at large and also by the legislature. With the El Paso shooting motivated by the killer wanting to stop Hispanics entering the United States, that added to other previous racially motivated mass shootings, a white supremacist domestic terrorism has been labelled another cause of mass shootings with demands for a crackdown on those with such alleged views. Is the frequency of mass shootings in the United States reaching epidemic levels? If so, what can practically be done to address this crisis? Well, to get some answers, I thought it would be good to speak to a real American, Michael Jacobson, who lives in Louisiana, and he runs the libertarian blog, The Uncensored Truth. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Now, before we get into the topic at hand, I'll ask you a bit about your website, theuncensoredtruth.net. You write a lot about firearms, but more than that, uh, I'll just ask you, what is your aim with it and where would you like to to take the site into the future? Well, some people would claim that my blog is a libertarian blog, which for the most part it is. Although sometimes with fellow libertarians, you wind up into arguments about how libertarian (laughs) these things are. Yep, definitely. Um, as far as what I plan for the future, it's, it's basically just to try and show that there's a common sense approach to handling most problems that we face. Um, you know, I, I try and cover problems and solutions in the articles that I write. And um, I think that it's not being very well shown in mainstream media as far as a normal reaction to problems rather than a radical reaction to problems that they demonstrate. Now, a lot of people who have opinions on firearms and and gun control, they're often people who've who've never fired a a gun themselves. And so they come at it as, I can't understand why people would feel the need to to go out hunting or feel the need to to own a gun. But you are an avid uh, gun owner and and hunter. I myself, I've only ever gone uh, shooting once basically because i thought i should experience that but just because it's not my preferred recreational activity doesn't mean i want to take it away from everybody else unlike some uh yes um weapons any sort of weapon is something to be respected and you need to take it very seriously whether you're going hunting or even target shooting at a uh, a practice range like there's buildings that you can actually fire indoor ranges safety is paramount with these things and you need to be very aware of what, what exactly you're using and the safety of others is should be a major concern. Now, the Australian perspective is uh, we see the news of mass shootings from the United States uh, all the time. We look at them with horror and can't understand Americans' obsessions with guns or how they won't embrace at least what we view as common sense gun control, like we introduced in 1996 after the Port Arthur massacre or New Zealand recently did after the, the Christchurch massacre. Uh, Some claim uh, they reconsider travel to the United States for fear of being caught up in mass shootings. Our recently passed uh, former Deputy Prime Minister Tim Fisher, who oversaw our gun control, used to suggest an official travel warning. Now, obviously, the news in the the US covers these shootings in a lot more comprehensive uh, detail. The the news channels, they broadcast live from the, the shooting site, yet there seems to be the not the same level of panic about this fear in the U.S. itself. Do you, do you feel safe in public? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have no point. I've been fortunate enough to travel all across this country, and at no point have I felt in any sort of danger as far as a mass shooting is concerned. And I take my general safety rather seriously. I'm very aware that there there are crimes, there are situations that you can get yourself into trouble while uh, mugging, any sort of thing like that. But as far as I've ever feared being in, being 
a victim of a mass shooting? Absolutely not. I feel perfectly safe as far as that's concerned. What about, I, I read on social media that uh, children in the United States, uh, they participate in, in drills in case there's a, a mass shooter because uh, that is... A, a common uh, venue for mass shooters, the most tragedy uh, being, of course, the, the Sandy Hook uh, massacre with the uh, the young children and people say, like, oh, young children in their first day of school, they shouldn't have to uh, prepare for if a crazed gunman comes in and tries to kill them. I kind of feel it's a very tragic thing for children to have to go through. I remember myself when I was much younger in, in school, um, the only drills I had to be ready for was a tornado drill or possibly a fire drill. Those were the biggest concerns of our time. And I really think that that's still the biggest concern of our time. A mass shooting drill in a school is kind of an overreaction. It's more there to make parents feel good and, uh, you know, government legislators feel like they're doing something responsible to the parents. But I feel that that fear is very overblown and unnecessary. Now, can you explain the what is seen as the, the U.S. mass shooting phenomena, because most statistical analysis conclude that the United States has had more mass shootings than any other country, both in terms of numbers and accounting for population. It's often quoted that uh, 393 million guns are owned by the civilian population. If it's not gun culture or easy access to guns, uh, what do you see as some of the, the factors? Well, one of the biggest factors is not, I don't want to consider a gun culture as much as crime culture. Um, there's many, many gangs and things like that that operate in, the, in every city, and they'll use whatever means necessary to achieve their aims. Um, gangs are basically fall interested in selling drugs, earning money, and um, that, that's where the real problem arises. It's not from the guns, it's from the people that are already in, intending to be criminals that use whatever whatever weapons, be it a gun, a knife, or anything, to accomplish their aims. As far as the 393 million guns that are owned in the United States, those are by legal gun owners. Most of these criminal organizations, they do not use legally purchased guns to accomplish what they want to do. Um, that would make it too easily be, tra too easily be easily traceable to uh, reveal whoever the culprit of whatever crime they committed would be, which is why they resort to using illegally purchased guns or what have you to accomplish what they want to, want to do. The two most recent high profile mass shootings in the United States were, was the one in El Paso, Texas uh, at the, the local Walmart and the one in Dayton, Ohio outside a nightclub. Now the, the, the killer in El Paso, he published a manifesto on 8chan where he was trying to stop the, the southern invasion. And of course, uh, this has become a new dimension that's added to the mass shooting phenomena uh, during the, the presidency of uh, Donald Trump, that it's alleged that mass shootings, they're perpetuated by white men who are motivated by hate towards others. Uh, there have been two shootings at uh, Jewish synagogues during uh, Trump's presidency. Now, Trump, with his uh, border security policies and alleged uh, dog whistles to white nationalists, has been accused of enabling uh, these hate crimes or, as, as they're also called, domestic terror acts. Uh, and, of course, the internet has been blamed for rad radicalizing these people, uh, for uh, spreading conspiracy theories. Uh, the left, who don't like the surveillance state, have been calling for authorities to profile white suspects and, and spy on these websites. Uh, well, there, there's a bunch of questions there. I'd like to try and answer them individually if I can. As far as a lo the last one you asked about profiling, I don't think that's correct, we, whether a person is white, black, Hispanic, or anything. At no point should we be profiling people just based off a of race. That's a completely improper and should not be allowed in any country, as far as I'm concerned. Um, as far as the recent mass shootings being perpetrated by white individuals, there are few and far between, regardless of how we look at this. I mean, as I mentioned before about uh, gang activity, the vast majority of mass shootings are committed in these gang-controlled territories, places like Chicago, where there's, they, there's reports every weekend coming out of many shootings, many of them being qualified as a mass shooting, and these are happening at a rate of maybe two per weekend just in one city. They're very localized, 
and they're often ignored by major media because the more sexy or important story to them is to mention someone being shot in a Walmart, which makes everyone feel a bit insecure about their own lives. And we also have to look at what a mass shooting is considered in the United States, which is that it's any shooting event where there's more than four people that are wounded. Doesn't mean that people have to be killed, just wounded. Are you this sure a, that it's... Yes. Uh, because as far as... At least from the, the definitions that I've read, I, I, I'm not 100% sure there's no definite, quote-unquote, this is the official definition for our country. But from what most outlets I've read, they say it's basically something more... An event where four or more people are wounded. Uh, what I've read is that, that four or more people are killed uh, because we in Australia technically had our first uh, mass shooting in, well, since we had comprehensive gun control in 1996 in the, the city of Darwin, which is in our north where, where four people were, were killed by. It was a recently paroled uh, mentally ill criminal who uh, got the gun illegally. Uh, yes, I understand what you're saying, and uh, I can personally tell you that I've read reports on mass shootings where that the um, report of a mass shooting was one person being killed, four or five people being injured, and th this is what the media reports as a mass shooting. And it's it's very unfair to, it, I'm not going to say unfair, but it's very misleading to say that multiple people being wounded would really count as a mass shooting. It's a unfortunate circumstance but when you think of a mass shooting you're thinking in terms of what exactly what you said more people being killed rather than wounded and uh in a lot of situations here that's not the case people remember that the, the united states is a diverse place there's 323 million people there and there are definitely crime hotspots where guns are used frequently obviously you mentioned Chicago, which has uh, one of the highest uh, gun murder rates uh, in the United States, and uh, the state of Illinois has strict gun control. Uh, Washington, D.C. is another example. And, of course, uh, what's been in the news recently is the focus on, on Baltimore, uh, since President Trump uh, attacked Elijah uh, Cummings. And, of course, what do those cities have in common? They're run by Democrats. Um, yes, that's very true. Well, there's also... Um... Don't forget, Los Angeles also has a very high crime rate, very high gang activity. I'm not sure exactly what the stats are as how many mass shootings they've had because of it, but I'm sure it's a very high number as well. Now, going back to, obviously, they're, they're wanting to hype up that it's uh, white people motivated by hate that are the, the main drivers of mass shootings, but there was a meme that was shared around post the two recent ones, which showed... Uh, pictures of the the mass killers in the United States in in 2019, and it's quite a racially diverse crowd. And I noticed that uh, Snopes, uh, uh, be, uh, being the uh, arbiter of truth that they like to be fact checked at, and they and the, the conclusion they came to is like, ah, oh, it's it's true. It depends on what your definition of mass shooting is, which means that it, that it is true because i do watch some of the the, the u.s uh, talk shows and one of the sort of sane late night talk shows is is bill maher and he talked about the the loner explanation is that the sort of promised high life that the youth of america were promised hasn't eventuated uh the four-year college degree is worthless blue collar jobs they've gone overseas so expectations are set very high by the media and entertainment you know all those reality shows of people living super successful lives living the high life yet the majority won't entertain them so it's led to a generation that's feeling betrayed by society that they're a failure and obviously the breakdown of the family and community leads these people to be further isolated and then of course there's the the toxic social media world which some people call anti uh, social media, which is, you know, everyone says they're anti-bullying, but, you know, have you said what, <laughs> seen what's online? And so that's uh, created a, a perfect storm of uh, dangerous resentment. Um, yes, I'd have to agree. There, There's a very, very big push to bring children graduating from school to go into college, take these expensive college degrees, and only until later on in life do they find out that these really were, were not worth the investment that they put into them. 
And sadly, it, it will lead to a lot of resentment. I and mean, people want to imagine when they're growing up, when they're when they're making their life choices, that they're making the right ones. And it's a shock to many of the younger people that they, they've been led down the wrong path. Now, does this lead to an in increase in violence? Yes, I believe it does. People being disappointed in their life, they're going to want to take measures to uh, correct it or lash out at people. And is, am I going to say that this is a, a real big reason for more mass shootings? I'm not, I, I can't tell you that one way or the other, unfortunately. But you did mention uh, the toxic atmosphere of the media, and I do believe that that feeds into this a lot. The media does a lot of work to make people feel helpless and hopeless. I mean, listen to CNN or MSNBC or any of those at any particular time, and a lot of times you, you feel that you can accomplish nothing without... Uh, without some sort of extreme measure. Um, voting doesn't seem to be very well encouraged. They, they tend to make it seem like Republicans are going to cheat to vote. Um, Republican outlets will make it seem like Democrats are gonna to cheat to vote. When people feel they can not accomplish anything through the legal, normal measures, they will tend to at least entertain the thought of taking matters into their own hands. Going back to the white uh, domestic terror hypothesis yes there have been quite a few who've been motivated by white nationalism or anti-semitism but it's been concluded that the the dayton ohio shooter even though he wasn't motivated by the ideology he was an antifa or elizabeth warren supporter recently there was the antifa uh, terror attack on a ice facility in in washington and let's not remember that uh, steve scalise the the Republican congressman. He was shot uh, at a congressional baseball game uh, by a mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders supporter and quite a number of others were were wounded and of course uh, Rand Paul had to have a kidney uh, removed because he was attacked uh, by his neighbor. So as we mentioned the, the toxic atmosphere it seems that both politics has become so polarized that it's like your side is committing the mass shootings no your side is because what i noticed about the because el paso broke first that uh, the, the narrative was that oh it's it's trump and white nationalism and i noticed a lot of people on the right sort of not saying anything until they knew about the ideology of the dayton ohio shooter and then when it was revealed he was uh, antifa supported based on his twitter then it was then it was like oh it's it's your side as well and so this it's become political size the the mass shooting as well like your side's causing mass shootings and terrorism uh, and so it's it's just a sort of blame loop that no your ideology is more toxic which as you mentioned that's politically motivated mass shootings at such a small minority of the actual mass shootings that, that go on. That's just what gains the most attention because yes. the news is about politics. I think you pretty much hit, it, hit the nail on the head with that one. There's uh, very few politically motivated mass shootings. And I, I really think the media does not spend enough time looking at the real reasons for why these happen. Now, I've written quite a few articles regarding um, drugging of children, uh, adults. Some of these drugs have horrible side effects. Um, schizophrenia, psychotic behavior. These are very real and very pronounced effects in certain people. And I don't think it's getting enough attention as far as the, these sorts of crimes. And I, I really think the media willingly passes a blind eye to this because it's not as interesting a story as saying, oh, well, this Republican did this, or this Democrat did this, or this member of Antifa did this, or this member of a white nationalist group did this. You, you can't sell a story based on saying, hey, we, we think that doctors and the media are not telling us enough about the side effects of these of these drugs that may or may not be affecting our minds or well, what's commonly blamed after every mass shooting for the past 20 years is is violent video games the the in video game at the moment is is fortnite i mean in australia fortnite was blamed for causing a domestic violence incidents that was broadcast on twitch but there's been studies done which has debunked this this link and i actually made the effort after the the recent mass shootings to not watch fox news because i knew they'd blame uh video games and it's just i'm ba I basically because we we talked about the internet as well and the the people that blame the the internet itself censorship is is never the answer whether it be the internet or a video game shutting things down i mean that's 
taking away liberties to for security, which of course uh, Ben Franklin said uh, you shouldn't uh, sacrifice liberty for security. And uh, there was one uh, Australian columnist, uh, Miranda Devine, she's actually based in the United States now, she blamed the legalization of marijuana in various US states for the rise in, in mass shootings, which was, which, which, which was a, a, a new one as well. A everyone has their sort of pet blame, but I definitely think because, yeah, there's, well, everyone's on medication these days. It's, it's certainly something worth exploring and it's certainly not something that's discussed by the media especially since they want to blame everything which is a very telling point i mean we we talk about video games we talk about uh things of that nature but why why wouldn't the media talk about the drug industry and the simple reason is because the drug industry is one of the biggest advertisers on these media stations why is someone sending you millions of dollars going to keep sending you millions of dollars if your company starts suddenly saying Oh, we think you're bad for everyone else. We, we think that you might be lying to us. Suddenly their advertising revenue is going to go from millions to nothing. And that, that's a very big driving force in uh, how much truth the media tells us, at least as far as the mainstream media is concerned. Now, I mentioned uh, the spread of conspiracy theories online. There's a lot of suspicion that, well, of course, there's always the, the false flag uh, accusation that... Uh, a lot of these mass killings because uh, there's a lot of uh, inconsistencies with initial witnesses but that's common in a lot of mass shootings. Most high profile ones is uh, Alex Jones is being sued at the moment by the Sandy Hook families because mm -hmm. he said uh, that was a false flag. Then there's the, the Stoneham Douglas high school shooting where David Hogg and, and Emma Gonzalez have been accused of being crisis actors. Now obviously those two shootings, yes, they like they have been supercharged uh, politically. There's not much evidence to suggest that they've been staged or are uh, crisis actors. But I think there is merit in that these the reporting of these mass shootings that distracts from other issues. And of course, it took away the two most recent mass shootings away from the the Epstein uh, case. He was still alive at that stage and you know, destroying all these dozens of girls' lives, that's that's pretty horrific. But, he, but of course he was back in the news uh, when he um, committed suicide. Like, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't believe the, the false flag hypothesis, but definitely they, the media leap onto them more than sort of the, the other political or just news stories that also should be talked about. Well, the, as far as the false flag aspect, um, a lot of people would like to think that false flags are just events that we want to make others believe have not happened. Um, in no way do I actually think that a false flag is can just be considered an event that didn't happen. It can also be an event that's overstated or we have information withheld from us as far as um, what actually happened. Uh, Bestowed in Douglas, the high school there, there was multiple reports of different shooters that was suddenly silenced. Now, whether or not there was or not, I couldn't tell you, I was not there. But um, there, they have interviews with witnesses who claim that there was. Um, I remember a teacher, that from, it was a video that was up for a while and was suddenly taken down from the internet where she claimed that she saw men in full tactical armor shooting into the kids. And uh, suddenly that story vanished. Now this does, unfortunately like I said, this doesn't mean it's correct or not. But uh, and in no way do I think that there wasn't a shooting at that high school because I believe there was and I believe there was real victims. But do I think it happened the way that the media is exactly telling us? No, I do not. I, I don't have the exact story for what happened and I probably never will, but I do not trust the official story from that, that particular shooting. As far as um, how other parts are represented, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly where where they're getting their details from, what's being omitted, what's being withheld from us. I mean, we, we have a right to know the truth about everything, but it seems, you know, coming through the media filter, people are, of course, going to have questions. If the media doesn't cover a certain aspect of something, a person's going to come up with their own conspiracy for what happened, right or wrong, because they're, they're not getting the answers to the questions that they need. And uh, we, we try to keep the media, we hope the media is being honest with us, but people can have very legitimate doubts 
And you're going to, of course, get the absolute crazy people who are just going to come up with these wild theories that, you know, a, a military SWAT team showed up at a place and mowed everybody down. And th those sorts of things are ridiculous. But it wouldn't surprise me if some of these people that are promoting conspiracy theories are doing so just to silence legitimate critics of certain events. Um, I've, I've read about government agencies that actually go on on, my me on media sources just to discredit people, such as you know, such as Facebook and Twitter. They'll go on there just to make people look bad, so what they're saying immediately gets thrown out by people that might may otherwise be inclined to listen to them. You mentioned that one of the the videos of the the Stoneham Douglas High School shooting was uh, removed. That suggested there was multiple shooters and uh, you, you raise an interesting point there that a lot of these conspiracy videos because or the fbi hasn't classified them as a domestic terror threat it's just one branch of the the fbi but of course the the fake news media say oh it's official fbi policy now but youtube has taken upon itself to remove a lot of the conspiracy videos like for example if you're typing clinton body count into to youtube it, it doesn't come up with anything about it and they've even taken down the the hillary is evil uh remix now treating people as as sheep if they watch a conspiracy video they'll get sucked in the rabbit hole and suddenly they'll they'll believe it like i think more and more people are becoming a, becoming aware that they shouldn't just like view one report or video and and believe it like all like videos and points of view should be available online so you can make up your mind yourself you should be able to explore it and i think that people are intelligent enough to to say yeah i see the points there or no that that doesn't make sense and of course censoring videos like I, like i mentioned a few examples that that fuels things further that oh you've got something to hide and so it actually has the the opposite effect exactly um the, the role of group of uh places like youtube and facebook should not be to limit what we can find out but to let people spread their ideas um the censoring of certain videos and that it is by itself going to perpetuate a conspiracy theory just based off the fact that they're cracking down on not letting people know about it. I mean, that's that's going to make more and more people curious, make them wonder why this is happening. And regardless of facts, when, when you see something, excuse my my cats are not scratching at my door, that's the noise you're hearing there. But uh, when you take these things down, it makes the people that would be somewhat skeptical of these theories to maybe perhaps take some of them more seriously just for the fact that there there is a crackdown on them. It's not the role of media sources to be our parents. It's up for us as adults to take in information and come to what should be hopefully an intelligent idea about what is going on. And when you take that away, you limit people's ability to um, learn about events and come to their own conclusions. As I mentioned, it took quite a while for the Dayton, Ohio shooters political views to uh, come out and it was basically because uh, people were able to dig online and find his Twitter account and there is a lot of suspicion that the mainstream media would have tried to cover that up if that information wasn't readily accessible and so it eventually came out because the evidence was overwhelming cnn reported it and of course uh snopes had to concede that oh yes it's true yeah it's a case of when they they're they try to shape news not for the truth but to how well they can sell a story to the viewers if you, if you make a story that's not appealing to your viewers you're not going to get ratings you're not going to get advertising revenue there is no obligation by american media to tell us the truth in fact, there was a court case, I can't remember exactly how long ago it was, but it was revealed in that case that media has no legal obligation to tell its viewers anything close to truth. They can they could completely make up a story and and tell us that that's, this is what happened, and we'll have no way of knowing, but I don't think that, that they completely make up stories, but I certainly think that they twist facts, they change details, just to lead people towards whatever viewpoint that they want their listeners to have, be it a liberal viewpoint, a conservative viewpoint, somewhere in between, as long as they can get their core audience to keep tuning in, keep them 
be watching between shows so they can keep that commercial revenue going. That's their priority, not the truth. Now, because the the two, the Dayton, Ohio, and the, the El Paso shooting, because they were different sides of politics, they cancelled each other out. And so the, mm. the, the media narrative turned to gun control uh, legislation. And of course, this is uh, talked about after every major mass shooting. Uh, I mentioned in Australia, the consensus even from the, the most uh, conservative commentators on TV is that Australia's gun control policies have uh, worked and kept us safe since 1996. Uh, well, they were introduced by a conservative prime minister in, in John Howard in response to the, the Port Arthur massacre, which, which killed uh, 35 people, which uh, well, was one of the worst mass shootings uh, in the world uh, at the time. So that, that's sort of the, there is a consensus view uh, in Australia, but as I mentioned, uh, the the gun culture in the, the United States with the amount of guns, well, legal guns, I, I should say, in, in circulation and the, the fact that hunting, it's an extremely uh, popular rec recreational activity. It's a completely different culture. Now, the, the power of the National Rifle Association is blamed for stifling what is deemed to be a common sense gun law reform. Uh, but it also should be said that the NRA, they're only as strong as their, their members. I mean, they only have millions and millions of dollars because people pay membership fees. The main opposition group is the, the Brady campaign to end gun violence, but that is also very powerful. I mean, their biggest supporter is businessman and former politician Michael Bloomberg, who owns Bloomberg Television. You know, he, 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 he's a pretty influential guy. Is there... Can anything be done from a legislative standpoint to curb mass shootings without violating the, the Second Amendment, which is pretty clear? I mean, there's a lot of, inter like, uh, people say that, oh, the Second Amendment it only refers to militias, but that's referring to one of the reasons why guns were necessary in that day, that militias are necessary for the security of the nation. but then why would it end with the, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed? I mean, that's pretty comprehensive at the end there. That, that's a good point. Uh, they actually make a point to mention militia and the people separately. They're, now, granted, they use a comma, but they mention militia and then they mention people. There's a reason for that. It's not just because we want to regulate the weapons that are available in militia. Or I should, should I not regulate the weapons that are in militia. I also believe that means that we should not regulate the weapons that are available to the people. Um, you, know, you mentioned starting off with the uh, NRA as far as their lobbying firms. I went on Open Secrets and I was checking to see exactly how much they donate to uh, various uh, Republican, you know, ba basically uh, lobbying interests. You'd be surprised to know that the uh, NRA is not nearly as big a lot, as, at least as far as monetary wise, is not as big as a lobbying group as you would think. I think that they give the NRA way too much credit for their power in Washington. And I've also read that the uh, membership of the NRA has been steadily decreasing in the last few years. As far as um, other political lobbying groups, there, there are many that have more spending power and more influence in the NRA. Is there anything that can be done from a legislative standpoint without violating the Second Amendment? I do not believe there is. And the reason why I say that is because as far as... Um, a lot of the violence, a lot of it's not even committed with uh, automatic weapons. It's with handguns, things like that. Um, there's sad situations where a father or mother will come home, find their significant other cheating on them. All of a sudden, they, something snaps in their head. They're like, well, I'm going to end it all. Kill their significant other, kill themselves, kill their children. Unfortunately, there you have a mass shooting event with four victims. And is there any sort of gun law that could have prevented that? No, because you... A person in a normal mental state can buy a weapon, they go through a background check, they go through all the legal hurdles, but there's no way to tell that in a year and a half some major psychological trauma like that is going to happen. There's nothing that you can do to prevent that. And as far as some of the other ones we mentioned, as far as gang violence and that, a lot of that is purchased, illegally purchased weapons. There's, there's no legal way to prevent any of that. Now, if we're talking about the ones where legally purchased weapons were used in a mass shooting event, they're... I, I don't want to downplay the significance of them, but there haven't been that many. And the only real way to prevent that is to just take the weapons from everybody. Now, do we punish millions of law, millions upon millions of law-abiding citizens 
for the sake of a very small few? No, I, I don't believe that's necessary, nor do I think it's constitutional. Well, it's going to be impossible to confiscate every civilian gun. Another tragedy that's that's mentioned uh, about uh, guns is that children uh, they can find their their parents' guns in the in the house, and there's been a lot of reports about how they can uh, can kill their, their their siblings, and that that's often used as well. Look at like. Uh, they're not even secure in in houses. Look, uh, look what children are doing. Uh, what, what do you say about that? Uh, th th those type of gun violence. That, that's one of the few that truly make me very angry because I do believe that people that have children should be more when they have children in their house. They should be more responsible with their weapons. Being, <laughs> being young myself, once I can tell you, I've gotten into almost everything that my parents had at one point or another. And uh, my father was smart enough to keep his le his weapons secure, and he, he was very aware of that. I mean, he, he served in the military. He was very aware of uh, the power of weapons and what can and can't happen. A lot of people do not bother to put that thought in. I, I've always been a personal advocate yeah, that if a child shoots someone with a weapon, you not you prosecute the parent, pro prosecute them to the full extent of the law as far as that's concerned. People need to understand that when you have children, they're not going to make the best decisions. You're the adult. You're the responsible one. If you shirk that responsibility, you need to be held responsible. Yeah, so as you talked about there, the, the NRA's actual power in lobbying is overstated. It's just that the NRA, they, they're considered a, a sinister organization. Uh, we had in Australia a well, documentary ad was produced by Al Jazeera, the, the Qatari media organization they secretly recorded two members of our one nation party which is one of our uh, populist uh, nationalist party going over to the united states to to learn things from the, the nra because they were were tricked by this fake uh, gun lobbyist for me like it, it exposed or well, it exposed the the nra's lobbying tactics but they're they're things that i already knew the the nra did the nra's lobbying is described as aggressive but Every lobby group is aggressive and threatens politicians and like, you know, we can, we can destroy you. That's, that, that's how lobbying is. That's how politics is. Exactly. Um, the media likes to uh, let us think that groups like the NRA are this dark, secretive, horrible organization. Now, I will be the first to tell you, I, I've, I've heard the same things that the NRA does do some very shady tactics as far as um, how they lobby and how they get people to do what they want. But um, I, I really do believe that their power has diminished. I believe it was in the 80s, maybe 90s, where they were probably at their peak, where they did have a lot of power as far as lobbying and how they could influence candidates um, in both uh, you know presidential and um, representative and senatorial levels. But uh, that power has gone down. But it's easier for the media to keep presenting them as the, the boogeyman of the lobbying firms rather than say something like, okay, um, like the Bloomberg, Bloomberg Group, they don't, that doesn't sound nearly as ominous as saying the NRA who wants to push guns on the, on everyone and keep guns from, keep prevent gun deaths and all that stuff. You, you can't say the same thing about the Bloomsburg group because then they'd have to go more into detail instead of spending years of, they've already covered the NRA for years and what they do. They would have to do that all over again to create a new target for people to envision. And it's much easier for the media to just keep focusing on the NRA. And you have to have a look at the, the current state of politics in the, the United States because about, or oh, even 10, 15 years ago, there were a lot of conservative uh, Democrats who they got high scores from the NRA and received NRA money. But if you look at the, the, the current Democrat presidential primaries, the party is now pretty much, if you want to be a Democrat, party president, you, you have to be in favor of gun control. I mean, there's even probably the most extreme one was Kirsten Gillibrand who said, yeah, we should, you know, confiscate all these guns and, and charge gun owners who don't hand them in, which we just went through as an absurd uh, proposition. So people like the Brady campaign and other gun control advocates have been successful in basically getting the, the Democrat party to support gun control and obviously the last remaining group that is supporting well 
I wouldn't say the NRA, but the, the Second Amendment, is the Republicans. Now, President Trump, uh, he's often uh, been suspected of being a closet gun control advocate, because if you look at a lot of his, his tweets, it's we need to sort of look at ways to, you know, uh, curb access to, to guns to the mentally ill, and there's talk of red flag laws. And of course, he, he, his administration banned bump stocks after the, the Las Vegas massacre, though there's this talk that he let the mentally ill regain access to, to firearms, reversing an Obama era uh, regulation. And uh, so, so Trump, you sort of feel that if he could, he would introduce significant uh, gun control. But of course, he's only the president and there's Mitch McConnell in the Senate who's been pretty adamant that he's not going to allow a vote on any gun control legislation. I agree. I, I think that if Trump was given the authority to do whatever he wanted, we would have gun control, massive gun control in this country. Um, there was actually one of the things in 2016 when he was running for president that I mentioned to everyone. I don't think that he's really pro Second Amendment at all. I think if he had his way, there, there would be an assault weapons ban. There would be more than just a bump stock ban. There would probably be ammo bans across the country. And uh, the only reason why there isn't is because he, he realizes that his electoral war base will not have it if he starts making sweeping measures such as that. He has to pander to his audience, basically, in order for him to stay politically relevant. And um, that, that's quite probably the only thing that prevents him from doing, doing all those things that we described. So let's go through them all just in specifics. So there's the universal background checks, and I mentioned the, the red flag laws, there's the assault weapons ban, there's, al there's always talked about the gun show purchase loophole that they don't need a, a background check. So I'm not sure if I've left any out, but can you just go through those about the merits of each? Okay, um, let's start with the red flag law. That's, I, I think it's a wonderful idea, but it's a poorly thought out one. And the idea that a per, any person can really report being afraid that they're going to do something wrong with a gun. It, does, it could be a parent, a, a parent, relative, neighbor. This is not a very good criteria for uh, sending police to someone's house. Um, at first, you could just be saying something like, hey, I, I, I'm feeling a little low in life. And that's enough for a neighbor to say, well, I think this person's suicidal and going to be a danger to themselves. Now, regardless of that, if he may be su feeling suicidal, does that mean he's a danger to others? No, he's a danger to himself, but if police show up, unfortunately, police in our country have a tendency to escalate a situation rather than de-escalate it. And we, we've already had reports of police coming to people's doors, trying to take their guns and getting shot. Not the police, the, uh, the person that in question. Universal background checks, um, for the most part, they already happen. I cannot purchase a weapon without having a background check. I, I don't think that there's any situation, even with my friends mentioning to me, where if they've purchased a weapon, that there isn't a background check. I'm not going to say how many firearms I have bought in my lifetime, but I'll, I'll, every single time I've had to go through a background check. Assault weapons ban is, uh, again, it's a, it's a feel good idea, but it's not very practical. Um, we can say whatever we want about how people should not have weapons that can fire multiple rounds in a minute. But let me tell you something, if there was a case, if I, fortunately I've never been in this situation, but if there was a case where multiple people were trying to break into my house and they had handguns or shotguns, would I only want to be able to respond with a handgun or shotgun? No, I would want something that gives me the ability to have superior firepower than the people that are attacking me. That's pretty common sense as far as home defense is concerned. Um, there are situations where hand, automatic weapons may not be appropriate, but does that mean that we should take them away from everyone just for that, for those particular reasons? No, there's very valid reasons for people to have assault style weapons. And uh, if we want to get more of the conspiracy theorist aspect, uh, one of the main reasons to have them is to resist a tyrannical government. And sadly, we have seen at least some indicators that our government is becoming more controlling, more tyrannical. Now, do I think they're going to round up people next week? Or no, by no, by no means do I think that's going to happen. But do I think it's a wise precaution for people to have these weapons in case it happens, in case it does happen at some point? Yes, I do. Yeah, you mentioned that the, the police, when they've been uh, investigating mentally ill people who shouldn't have guns, they've, they've shot them. And that is another big issue in the United States. You want to talk about gun violence. What about uh, by the police uh, forces? Because that seems to be the, the, the policy of a lot of uh, police and authorities uh, shoot first, 
uh, questions later. And I think, I'm uh, sorry if you're libertarian, Sherry Mean, but it's like, oh, uh, you, you want to uh, disarm killers, disarm the government, which is, it's a decent point. I've heard about, you know, all the, all the SWAT teams that most commonly they kill family dogs. I mean, it's not just people uh, with guns that is a problem, it's the, the government, basically, their, their trigger happy culture that's led to a lot of deaths. Uh, yes, I agree. The police are, are held in a, a different regard than the average citizen here. We, we do have a culture of um, almost worshipping police forces. Not that I have a problem with uh, police officers themselves. I, I do personally have some issues with them, but I do still think police are necessary for any society. Do I think that um, the scale of our police forces should be toned down a bit? Yes, I do. Um, I really do think that uh, the, the culture in the police society today is to be aggressive towards everyone but treat everyone as a potential threat, they're supposed to serve us. And uh, when, you, when you confront an average citizen in a threatening manner, bad things are going to happen. I mean, if a citizen, even a law-abiding citizen, who might be just car legally carrying a firearm on their side, if an officer comes up and scares the hell out of them, people react in very different and uh, erratic situations at that point. And I believe that a lot of these deaths by police, a lot of them wouldn't have happened if, if the police approach it not as a uh, assault situation, but as something that they could work out with the individual. And you had also mentioned um, a lot of dogs getting shot, and, and that, that is a, a truly tragic thing. That I, I've seen video after video after video of this happening, and it seems like absolutely nothing is being done to stop this. And I don't understand that. I, I don't understand. You know, I, I can see an aggressive dog charging, barking, snarling at a guy. Okay, fine. That that's fine. But a lot of these videos are the dogs looking at an officer coming up to sniff them, and the officer dumping two bullets in the dog's head. There is no call for that. And for some reason, it's people look the other way. Well, people will speak out against it, but uh, the agencies, the law agencies that are supposed to stop these these sort of police ex excesses, do absolutely nothing about it. And I, 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 to this day, I do not understand why. And of course, you mentioned that a lot of Americans have, have guns to protect them from tyranny, which is another factor in, in why a, poli a lot of politicians don't want to implement significant gun control, because there are so many guns and because there'd be so much uh, resistance. I, obviously, after uh, September 11, there was the, the government could take away as much liberty as they liked in that, in that uncertain mm -hmm. environment. But since then, the, the U.S. population, well, especially sort of the, the conservatives and the right in the Obama era, they, they realize you know, how, how government can be, can be bad again and sort of that suspicion of government has uh, returned. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the, the U.S. population is, is so large that obviously the, the president of the United States gets a lot of news, but he's actually not that very influential in in day-to-day -day life because the united states is so decentralized so if you decided to take away all the guns that would be pretty pretty big deal and significant action over the whole of the population uh yes you're, you're quite right the uh the president he gets a lot of media attention but as far as what he can do to affect our lives it's really not that much i mean it, it's Anything in Congress is more important as far as that's concerned. If the government did try and take it over, it, it would it would d definitely not end well. I, I tend to think that it would have to be a pretty large breach of Americans' liberties for most Americans to rise up. Because most of us, we, we don't want to go out, you know, shooting at you know even corrupt officials. We don't we don't want that. We want to live our lives in peace. We want to be able to you know go to our jobs. And uh, violence is something that. I think very rarely crosses people's mind. I mean, normally when I'm talking to people, that they're not talking about you know stocking up for the impending collapse of civilization or anything like that. But they, it, it's something that every now and again it crosses their mind, and they think that it should be something. But we don't want to have to be confronted by it, or and we would rather not have to uh, even consider it. But uh, unfortunately, it seems to be more and more of a reality as as time goes by. Well, after every mass shooting, it's widely reported that uh, gun sales increase because the mm -hmm. population, they fear gun control, which is quite telling. Oh, uh, yes. Again, it's a matter of when start, people start to think about these things because it's not something that regularly we, we think about. And uh, when the media starts throwing in our faces, making us terrified to even walk out the door, 
we, that, that's when people need to start thinking to themselves, look, do, one, do I need to live like a, I'm terrified all the time? The answer to that is no, of course you don't. But uh, you, you, you should take necessary steps to defend yourself. Sometimes when we get these shock values, that's why the gun sales go up because uh, that's what it, it starts to occur to people that uh, maybe they're not doing enough in their lives to uh, protect themselves, protect their family, protect their neighbors. There's going to be continue to be more mass shootings uh, in the the United States. I mean, obviously we can't predict the future, but there's been at last count 248 in in 2019. So when the when the next one happens or the next skew happen, like the rest of the world, like in Australia, we're going to be tut tutting at you Americans with their guns, and of course there's going to be the media saying, you know, something must be done. And of course, uh, with your uh, website, uh, the Uncensored Truth, you're obviously going to want to, to comment on it. Will you stick to what your hypothesis is? I mean, how will you respond to uh, the next massacre? Do you think? I'll absolutely stay with the same uh, opinion I've had of this for many years. Um, mass shootings or even uh, gun deaths in general are very, very, very small percentage of, uh, of this population. I believe it's well less than one-tenth of one percent. It's not as common as people try and make, you know, especially the media tries to make it out to seem. And it's just a, a problem that is way overlooked. We have more people that die in car accidents than from gun deaths. It's basically a media-generated problem to keep people terrified and to keep them rationally thinking about a situation and instead making um, illogical conclusions and illogical decisions. That's, that's how I think a lot of these bad, bad laws are passed. And um, I think that's going to continue more than anything. There's going to be more encouragement to keep people non-thinking, keep them terrified in an effort to get these gun control laws passed. And um, it, it's going to result in a net loss of safety and liberty for the American citizen. Well, like we've said, the the political climate, not just with guns, but with a lot of things, has changed. So it's certainly something that will will be in discussion in the near future. And if a Democrat is elected in, in 2020, that could change uh, quite a lot. But I've appreciated you uh, coming on the show and giving an American perspective, uh, because I think it's important for or Australians who, who think they know what's good for the US to actually hear uh, from somebody and that it's okay to visit the United States and well you're obviously quite a well-informed person and so you're not just um, you know gun-toting rednecks so I certainly <laughs> hope a lot of people hear what you have to say and might uh, give their their position a bit more rational thought. Well, thank you very much. I uh, greatly appreciate being on your show, and I hope for the people listening there in Australia that uh, you have a little bit more insight into how things are happening over here. Um, if you disagree with me, I understand, but I hope for those who take a open-minded view, you understand that not not everything is so cut and dry as the media tries to tries to portray it to you. And uh, thank, again, thank you very much for having me on the show. I greatly appreciate it. And that's the show for today. I've got more insightful guests in the works, so make sure that if you're watching on YouTube or on your favorite podcasting platform, you allow yourself to receive notifications when Future Waves episodes are released. Don't forget to catch up on the latest Detonation episodes on the Unshackled YouTube channel, which is hosted by my colleague Steel Archer, and of course episodes of The Uncuckables, our joint production with the XYZ and The Rational Rise on its own dedicated YouTube channel. It is broadcast live there every Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. Melbourne time. Remember to counter the fake news and algorithm manipulations. For your search needs, use duckgo.com and also for your information needs, use InfoGalactic because as we know, uh, Google and Wikipedia, they've been skewing the information to make sure you get a slanted what they want you to see. And of course, we're on free speech social media to escape Facebook and YouTube censorship. There have been more uh, suspensions from Twitter recently. So we are on gab.com slash the unshackled. We are also on minds.com slash the underscore unshackled. We are also on mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled. And we also have our Telegram channel on the encrypted messaging service at t.me slash the unshackled. Remember that we cannot produce all the shows and articles and our ever-expanding list of coverage unless we have uh, the support of you, our viewers, 
and our listeners. And the best way to support us is by supporting us financially. You can go to patreon.com slash the unshackled or paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash membership and our web donation form, theunshackled.net slash donate. We are also on subscribestar.com slash the unshackled and of course our online merchandise store with some of our most popular merchandise at theunshackled.net slash store. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you very soon for the next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.